Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, just to let you know that we'll start in about uh, four or five minutes. We'll just give a few minutes for uh, people who are a little bit late to join us. All right, I think we could maybe get started. Uh, good morning or afternoon or evening, depending where you're joining us from in the world. Uh, my name is Doug Evans. I'm the director of the International Institute for Environmental Studies, and I want to welcome you to this, the fourth lecture in our uh, series on uh, environmental and human health risk assessment. And our speaker today is Dr. Ian Oliver, but just before I introduce him, uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, details. Um, uh, I would ask you to keep your um, mics muted uh, unless you're asking a question, just to uh, decrease background noise. Also, I would uh, remind you that at the bottom of your screen, uh, you have a chat function. Uh, you can click on that, and throughout the lecture, if you have questions that come to you, uh, jot them down, and then uh, at the end of the lecture, uh, our guest speaker can uh, answer those questions for you. Um, also, just want to uh, remind any graduate students joining us that uh, the IIES will be organizing a graduate student research seminar series in January, 
uh, call for abstracts to uh, make presentations in that series is still open. And so I would uh, encourage you to go to our website and check that out uh, if you haven't already done so. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Ian Oliver. And Dr. Oliver uh, comes from uh, the uh, Keele University in the UK, where he's a lecturer in environmental science. Uh, he did his uh, undergraduate, master's, and PhD degrees at the University of uh, Adelaide in Applied Science, Environmental Management, and Environmental Chemistry. And he's now the uh, Terrestrial Ecotoxicology Editor for the Journal of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry and a Fellow of the British, uh, so British Society of Soil Science. Um, his research interests are uh, biogeochemical cycling of contaminants and nutrients in the environment, uh, looking at questions of how soil contamination impacts terrestrial ecology and the wider uh, functions of soil, and how water quality is impacted by land management and chemical release. And so he has uh, quite an interesting uh, background uh, in the area of environmental impact assessment. And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, ask you to present your uh, talk, please, Ian. Okay, thanks very much, Doug. Um, can you, people can hear me, I'm guessing? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. I'm going to try and share my screen. So, okay. So, with luck, you should now be seeing my PowerPoint slides, is that correct? Yes, we can see them as well. Excellent. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks folks for uh, inviting me. Um, this should last for about 30 minutes, I think, leaving plenty of time for questions. So do note down any questions in that uh, chat box and we can um, get to those. Uh, okay, so in this session, I'll give you just a quick one or two slide history of environmental impact assessments and where they came from. Then we'll get into the type of projects that people conduct environmental impact assessments for and those that they don't have to do it for. And then we'll go through the stages of the environmental impact assessment process. And then I will give some examples of some of the uh, EIAs that I have been uh, involved with over the years. And then we'll just do a quick summary to wrap it all up. Okay, so Environmental impact assessments as a structured formal process has kind of emerged out of the environmental movement of the 1960s. Before that, people thought about the environment, cared about the environment, obviously, but it became a, a formalized progress a process uh, after this period. So to, to state what an EIA, an environmental Im impact assessment is, there's a procedure designed to ensure environmental implications are taken into account before e development decisions are made. So it's all related to some kind of project, some kind of development, and we're assessing the impacts before that actually happens. So some important bits of legislation uh, that relate to environmental impact assessments. Uh, the first emerged in the USA, the National Environmental Policy Act, which came out in 1969, 1970. Then for those of us in the European Union, we had an environmental impact assessment directive that was first formulated in 1985 and now has been through a number of uh, reiterations and updates. And importantly, in 1992, at a UN conference on environmental development and management in Rio, uh, the United Nations came up with this Rio Declaration on Environment and Development. Now, at that conference, there were 170 countries or more that were present and agreed on these principles and signed them off. So I think probably most of the people who are attending this lecture or will listen to it at some point. Um, your country probably signed up to this. So there'll be some kind of national framework in place uh, that you can check out the local um, uh, regulations that control that. But anyway. As part of this Rio Declaration of 1992, there were 27 principles that were agreed upon. And they're very wide ranging, but the ones that relate mostly to environmental impact assessments were number 15, which is the precautionary principle. Now the precautionary principle is the idea that something 
that is planned or someone wants to do some kind of activity or process, the onus is on that person or that company to show that it is safe before proceeding rather than the other way around and having the activity proceed and then only stop if it's shown not to be safe. So the precautionary principle is, is very important and underpins um, this Rio Declaration and other uh, UN agreements. Principle number 16 was the polluter pays principle, which as the name suggests, is that anyone who makes environmental damage should be the one that pays for it and cleans it up. And finally, of these 27 principles, number 17 uh, specifically mentioned environmental impact assessments, and it stated that EIAs should be conducted before any activity that have significant adverse effects on the environment. So 170 countries or more have all signed up to have this as part of something that they agree to. So any major development in any of our countries should really involve some kind of environmental impact assessment process. Uh, this is the Environmental Impact Assessment Directive for the European Union. I'm, I'm based in the UK, so this is the one that I work under. Um, it would be interesting for the people listening to go and check out their regulations for, for their regions, for their jurisdiction. Um, you should be seeing lots of similarities, but there might be differences of terms, um, but it should all relate. And for those of you in Europe, um, there is the one that we look at. You can get a copy of it yourself if you ever want to have a read and refer to it. And I have copies of it. If anyone wants to have that, you can email me and I'll send it out to people. Okay, so the big question then is, when do we have to do an environmental impact assessment? And when don't we have to do one? It's not for any kind of process, any kind of development project, but only for certain types. So in Europe, that EIA directive I just showed you spells out which ones must have an EIA and which projects can be uh, had an EIA done if the local authority deems it necessary. And there will be equivalents to this in all of your jurisdictions. So let's have a look at those different groups, the ones that must have an EIA and then those that it's up to discretionary um, decisions of the local authorities. In that first category, these are the ones that if they're going to happen, they have to have environmental impact assessments. These include really major developments, major projects. So we're talking uh, emplacement of oil refineries or uh, chemical production on industrial scales, new power stations or combustion installations, um, so nuclear power, uh, coal uh, burning stations, uh, nuclear waste disposals, or mines. If you're going to establish a mine or expand a mine, then you have to have an environmental impact assessment done. Other industrial activities such as steel or um, other metal smelting, but even for things like wastewater treatment plants, if it serves a large population, then EIAs are necessary. Similarly, uh, petroleum or oil storage facilities or waste uh, disposal sites, so landfill sites, you need to conduct an EIA. Railways, um, there are lots of uh, railways in, in development, um, particularly high speed ones, long distance ones. Uh, they are a major infrastructure development and impact the environment across a, a large space, a large area. So they require environmental impact assessments, as do airport runways and major roads. Uh, also development of dams for things like hydropower stations will need environmental impact assessments to be made. Then in that second category, these are the kinds of projects where you may or may not need to do an environmental impact assessment. It depends on the local jurisdiction, the local uh, competent authority, the environmental agency, for example, that will determine whether environmental impact assessments are needed. So this involves things like changes to land use, so moving from natural areas or pasture land, moving to intensive agriculture, or installation of waste management um, projects or changing uh, land designations from forestry or from pasture into forestry, so afforestation. Any of these kind of activities are likely to fall into this category of they might need an EIA and need to consult with the local authorities. Uh, development of wind farms, um, 
manufacturing ships or motor vehicles or glass. So quite sizable, but not massive infrastructure projects or development projects, they're going to fall into this category. Okay. So here is a breakdown of the types of stages involved in the environmental impact assessment process. Now they can be subdivided further or grouped together in slightly different ways, but wherever you do environmental impact assessment, these are the kind of activities that is going to be involved. So if we start with part one, uh, we look at the screening step. So here we're asking ourselves, do we need an EIA to be done? Well, if the development project is in that first category, that major development category, then automatically we know that we are going to need an EIA. But if it's in that second category, with the slightly smaller, um, but still important developments, then you have to consult with the competent authority, for example, Environment Protection Agency, as to whether one is needed, and also local authorities. So this is part of the screening step. This helps us to identify if a formal EIA is warranted. In order to do that, in order to determine whether your project is big enough to warrant an EIA, you need to consider the size and the design of the project. How close is it to other things, to other developments? What resource use implications are there? What waste is going to be produced? Also, whether there are pollution issues and nuisance issues. So here we're talking about water pollution, soil pollution, and air pollution, and even things like dust and noise can be considered as a major impact on surrounding areas. You can also identify some of the mitigation options. And then we need to consider how permanent is the impact going to be? The location is important. So how sensitive is the local environment? How rare are the habitats or species in the area? Are they locally rare? Are they regionally rare? Are they globally rare? These things need to be considered and also whether the area has any kind of special designation, any special status, such as a site of special scientific interest or national park or some other uh, important designation. In this screening step, the developer, the group, company, agency that wants to make the project will typically go through some kind of consultant to establish a base, um, a baseline. To do that, they'll do a death study. They'll visit the site and they'll conduct uh, what here we refer to as a phase one habitat survey. So this is to identify the types of habitats in the area and whether they are locally rare, or regionally rare, um, etc. And then you can make a preliminary evaluation as to how big is the impact going to be, how important is the site for natural features or societal cultural features. The screening step therefore typically covers the site location and its history. So we'll produce a bunch of maps and we'll pull out that information uh, such as whether it's a national park or historic monument site or cultural heritage site and do an overview of the likely impacts on the uh, terrestrial and aquatic habitats. So it will do a description of those habitats and outline how sensitive they are to any kind of development in the area, flagging up any kind of rare species or rare communities that might be present. It will overlap onto that the extent of the development so that the scale of the impact can be seen. And then a decision can be made as to whether it falls into those categories that does not need an environmental impact assessment. I mentioned baseline conditions. This chart attempts to outline what we mean by that. The baseline conditions are how the area would be if the project did not proceed. So if we did not do the development, what would be the conditions of the site? Once we establish that, then we can determine what the likely impacts are and relate them back to that baseline condition. So in order to do this, this needs some kind of survey work to be done. So habitat surveys or water surveys, uh, air quality surveys, soil quality surveys, depending on what kind of project is being envisaged. So if we're talking about the development of a landfill site, you might go out and measure the existing noise in the area, uh, existing level of dust in the area, and then 
do a comparison to what that's going to be like if the landfill was produced. And then we can semi-quantitatively determine what that impact is going to be. So these are the kind of areas that we'd have to consider. So water quality, but also the quantity. Is the water going to be used? Is it going to be abstracted? Is it going to be increased? For example, if a hydro dam for hydro power schemes is going to be installed. What about accessibility? If a site is going to be developed, will that affect the accessibility of water to organisms, but also to people for use for various applications, including other industrial uses? We need to consider the soil. Is the project development going to impact on the soil or is the soil already degraded? Is it already quite a, a damaged site and therefore of low uh, conservation value? But there's more wide ranging effects that we need to consider, including things like runoff and flooding. If you are to develop some kind of installation, a factory, a warehouse, then you are doing quite a lot of surface sealing and that can result in increased runoff and increased flooding of the area. So that has to be considered. The flora and fauna of the area, as we mentioned, needs to be considered. Uh, the air and also the built environment. What kind of impacts to transport networks are going to happen if you're going to develop some kind of installation? You'll probably need to develop new roads to access it. How is that going to impact on existing infrastructure? Uh, bus routes, car routes, uh, trucking routes, uh, railway routes. All these kind of things need to be examined for any potential impacts. So once that is all done, then the, the competent authority uh, will determine whether that environmental impact assessment is needed or not. And if it is, then it proceeds to the next stage, uh, called, uh, often called the scoping stage. However, even if there's not a formal EIA needed, very often, if it is a substantial development that is going to take place, the local government, the local authority, will probably ask for some kind of environmental assessment to be done anyway. This is because we are now in a, in a time where companies need to be seen to care about the environment. So quite often, even if a formal EIA is not going to be needed, they'll want some kind of survey to be done, some kind of assessment, so that they can show that they have had a not too bad impact on the environment or the new uh, development. Otherwise, they risk people boycotting their, their products or coming to their new site to use it. This is quite often referred to as an environmental assessment. So as you can see, they kind of drop the word impact from the middle, but they still do a sort of a small environmental assessment. But if we proceed to the scoping stage, to so the second stage in the EIA, this is where the developers, or more likely their environmental consultants, they take things further and they identify the key potential environmental impacts and their concerns. So this usually involves a consultation process with planners and, and regulators, so the Environment Protection Agency or the equivalent, but also public consultation. So members of the public are invited to make comment on their concerns for any kind of development that's being proposed. Non-government organisations, for example, conservation charities will also be consulted to see what their views are on the project. As an example, in, in the United Kingdom, we have some very big charities that look after bird life. So the British Trust for Ornithology or the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, they own quite a lot of land that is used for plant and bird protection. And therefore they're very interested and very concerned if new developments are going to happen near their land. So they are consulted and invited to make comments to raise their concerns. At this scoping stage, the alternatives to project development options and mitigation measures can also be brought forward. So if there is a concern that's raised, at this early stage, it's possible to identify ways to get around that problem, to let the project still go forward but to not have the impact that people are being concerned about. And it's also an early opportunity to highlight the benefits of the project. Environmental impact assessments are not just about trying to 
limit a development or trying to stop the impacts from it. It's an opportunity to show how a project, a development can actually enhance the environment of an area and make the uh, environment better and have a positive outcome. Now, when this is done, the scoping stage alone usually generates many documents. You have many scoping documents produced that capture all of these different things. So the environmental impact assessment process usually generates lots and lots of different documents, all of which can be used and collated together. The next step is to go more in depth to try and quantify those impacts that the concerns have been raised about. So here, the impact assessment describes and evaluates the significant environmental impacts, looking at things like soil impacts, water impacts, air, um, any uh, infrastructure implications, even things like archaeological heritage. So it tries to quantify those impacts rel related back to those baseline conditions that we mentioned earlier. So while the screening step was more of an overview, here in the impact assessment stage, things are really dug into at greater depth. So we have quantification of the level of impact, so how many species are going to be displaced, what percentage of locally important tree space or species distributions are going to be damaged, all related back to those baseline conditions. Again, it takes it further in terms of how important is the local area. If we are considering the installation of a new railway line, for example, then you would need to quantify how much damage is there going to be in terms of what proportion of the species in the area are significant. Are they very common or are they rare? Uh, are they key species for ecosystems that depend on them, including migratory species that might not be present at the time when the screening step is done and when these surveys are done? You need to think about, for example, migratory birds that might use a site on their passage through to other countries, other continents. We also need to think about not just the end result, so not just the, the railway once it's finished or the power station once it's finished, but also the construction stage. What is the level of impact going to be during construction? So during excavation stages, during movement of equipment, during transport, um, during the, the setting up, the operation, and also in terms of things like landfills or power stations, what about the decommissioning stage? When these things are decommissioned, it is taken out of action and returned to some kind of other use, how is that going to impact on the environment? And is that going to be a permanent impact or is it going to be a transitory impact? So here we're trying to quantify all of those things. And again, it will generate multiple documents. So we will have impacts looking at infrastructure aspects, impacts looking at ecological aspects and even social aspects. And here, these documents may, might not be available to the public, so these need to be collated and brought together into something that is public facing and you'll see where that comes into the process later on. The management and enhancement step, here is where you can bring into account measures that can be taken to try and reduce the negative impacts. So this can involve some kind of compensation and by this we don't mean giving money to the people who care about the birds or the trees or such things. It's about doing some kind of offset process or providing a compensation of an area that might be damaged by the project to replace it somehow. So if we've got a site where we're going to clear an area and remove those ecological resources, is there another part of the site that can be established as a wildlife corridor, for example, or as a breeding area for displaced animals? So we can include replacement of habitats or other kinds of uh, ecological compensation measures. And in order for this to be taken seriously and for the environmental impact assessment to be seen as thorough, then the compensation aspects have to be proportionate to the level of the impact. So if you're going to clear fell an area of forest of 100 hectares, offering one hectare as a wildlife corridor is probably not going to be seen as 
a real bit of compensation. So it's got to be proportional and it's got to be targeted. It's got to suit the, the species or the, the, the features that are going to be damaged in order for it to be taken as a, a real level of compensation that can mitigate the problems. It's also an opportunity to take forward those enhancement options. So here we can quantify what kind of enhancement can happen. A development can lead to an increase in biodiversity or an increase in habitat provision or other kinds of environmental benefits. And this part of the environmental impact assessment really brings that out in order to, to show the, the positive benefits. Once all of those steps are done, here it's all brought together into that public facing document. So all of those documents that are produced during those earlier stages, they're brought together in what we call an environmental statement. And this is the part that the public see and that journalists read if they're interested in looking at environmental problems in their area. So it's a concluding document that summarizes, it, brings it all together. So it repeats quite a lot of what was already done, but puts it in a more succinct form. So it describes development and shows the mitigation measures that are being proposed, including any bits of refinement uh, that came out of the consultation process during the scoping stage and during the, the mitigation and enhancement stage. It gives an overview of the significant environmental impacts. So the things that came out from the environmental impact stage, it gives those quantified environmental impacts to draw out the key points so people can be easily uh, able to see what those main problems are going to be or what the main changes are going to be. And then it usually has a quite lengthy bit of conclusion and recommendations. And this is the part that decision makers, for example, Environment Protection Agency, will use in order to make their decision. So the conclusions would bring out the main impacts and also the main needs going forward. So what kind of future monitoring is required and what kind of other planning is needed? And then once that is done, it's released and the project developers wait and hope for a positive outcome from the regulatory authority. Uh, and if they get the all clear, the, the green light, the development can go ahead. If it is not, then usually there'll be some kind of reapplication addressing those problems that have been identified that the regulatory authorities have had the most concerns about. So quite often an environmental impact assessment will go through multiple uh, repeats in order to come up with a project that is acceptable to the environmental regulator that ultimately gets to make the decision. That was the process, that's an overview of the environmental impact assessment process. Now I thought I thought uh, I would finish with a few examples that I've come up uh, against or worked with uh, during my career. Uh, just two examples, uh, they come from my time when I worked for the Environment Protection Agency in Scotland. And this first one was the development or redevelopment of a Scottish gold mine. There was a small gold mine, a test gold mine, if you like, that was developed in the Lormont and Trossachs National Park area. And this was proving successful. And so the developers wanted to expand it to make it into a full scale gold mine, uh, commercial quantities of gold to be produced. In order to establish the full gold mine, it was going to require quite a lot of development processes, including diverting a river. A river was moving through the area, so there was a plan to dig that river out and channel it around it, and also to redirect groundwater that came into the area. The development would require mine shafts to be dug, and also a construction of a quite large tailings dam to take liquid and sludge outputs from the mining stage. There was also an impact that could have 
have arisen from the flotation chemicals and mining chemicals that were going to be used. So things like xanthanates were going to be used to help separate the ore and all the components of the ore. That would have been held in the tailings dam for a period, but then released back into the river. So we had to look at the extent of the impact that those releases might cause to things like salmon and trout. The project would also require roads and new buildings to be constructed. And bear in mind, this was within a national park, so quite a sensitive area. It required quite a large team. Lots of different expertise was required for these large environmental impact assessment exercises. So the team involved ecologists, engineers, environmental chemists, like myself, geologists, hydrologists to look at those diversions of, of water. But also public liaison and environmental regulators had to be fully involved uh, in the process. In the end, the environmental impact assessment uh, was concluded and there were too many problems. So it went back to stage one. They had a scaled down version of the of the proposed mine. They increased the holding space in the tailings dams. They could hold the chemicals for longer so that they would degrade more. And therefore, by the time they were released into the river, they were at a lower concentration and therefore having less impact on uh, the, the trout and the salmon that lived in the area. So it was all looking very positive. They managed to do the changes that were required in order to make the impact a much lesser degree. And the environmental regulators who I worked for were quite happy with the procedure being described and with the project that was being put forward. So in the end, the environmental regulator approved this mine development and the uh, local population were quite excited about it because it meant many jobs to be created and lots of income for the area. But in the end, it did not move forward because the, the local government got nervous about the implications of allowing an industrial development in the national park. So it was a bit of a pity that the proposers and development people had to go through all of that. And in the end, it was denied uh, progression because of that perception. But that's the reality in which we live in. My second example is another one from Scotland, this time a coal mine that was going to be developed in Fife. Uh, as you can see from the map, it's not a million miles away from, from Edinburgh. In, in fact, it's about only 20 miles or 32 kilometers from the capital of Scotland, Edinburgh. So it, it's not in a remote location. This is, this is quite near to where people live and to farming areas. The proposal was to mine the 3.4 megaton coal reserve that was known to be beneath this, this lake, at Loch Fitty is the name of the lake. The proposal was therefore to drain Loch Fitty to establish the coal mine, then dig out uh, the coal uh, for um, commercial use and divert any groundwater that would have drained into the area. The plan was for the mine to take six years during its active phase of a coal extraction. And then there would be an 18 month to two year period where it would be decommissioned, the land would be restored, and the, the lake would be refilled, allowed to refill naturally with the grain groundwater that would be no longer diverted. So the whole period of impact for this proposed development would be eight years with ongoing monitoring. Now, on the face of it, you would think that this probably is not going to get approval because you've got a nice lake surrounded by agricultural areas. Surely we can't just drain the lake and make a big coal mine. But the environmental impact assessment process was able to show the many benefits that were possible if it went ahead. That environmental impact assessment process it was able to demonstrate during the, the mitigation and enhancement phase, uh, and also related back to the baseline survey uh, phase, that there was lots of benefits to be had. For example, 
the initial surveys were able to show that the quality of the water in the lake was actually very poor. It failed the environmental quality standards, the EQS for phosphorus. It was also shown that the sediment underneath the lock lake water was quite high in metals. So it had levels of chromium, copper, nickel and zinc that would be considered to be contaminated or at least not ideal. The ecological survey was able to show that the fish that lived in the lake were not native fish, they were invasive fish, uh, rootless, rootless. And not only were they invasive and not native fish, but the fish had heavy infestations of a, an undesirable lice, so uh, an invertebrate species, uh, Argulus foliaceus. And you can see in the bottom right of the screen there. So therefore, this development, even though on the surface looks like it might be a bad thing for the environment, after a bit of delving and the environmental impact assessment process, it was able to show that there were some real opportunities to enhance the environment here and to restore it. So getting rid of the contaminated sediment, replacing the water with clean water, and cleaning out these invasive fish with their heavy lice infestations. So this is able to show how environmental impact assessment can be used to enhance the development and people's perception of the development. In the end, this proposal was also approved and was, well, at least leaning towards being approved by the environmental regulator because of all these benefits. But unfortunately, the company that was proposing it then ran out of money and so they did not go ahead with the, with the proposal. But here we go, again, financial realities. I'm not sure if they ever found the money to do it. Um, I've not checked back that, it's been a few years, but it would be interesting to see if they went back and uh, found the money and extracted the coal and were able to realize these enhancements. Okay, so now just to, just to sum up, the environmental impact assessment is an evaluation of the likely impact from some development project. It's a site-specific investigation, so there is no one-size-fits-all, there's no off-the-shelf environmental impact assessment process that you can just apply. It always has to be adapted from the existing framework and made to suit a particular site and the de particular development. The scope may vary depending on the project. For example, if it's a project to do with creating a mine or a quarry, then all of those environmental aspects are going to be in play and the scope will be quite wide ranging. However, if it's a development of a road, then you're no longer talking about displacement of large amounts of earth, but rather you're talking about soil sealing and noise pollution and uh, infrastructure impacts. So the scope is also going to be site specific and project specific. The environmental impact assessments considers not just the size, the geographic extent of the development, but also the duration, the time, and the degree of the impact. So how many species are going to be impacted upon? Uh, how important are they? What uh, roles do they play in the wider ecosystem? It's important to remember that it's a multi-stage process. These things take time, often years, and they generate a whole suite of reports for the clients, and then finally that one forward-facing, public-facing document. And if you have an ambition to be environmental consultants and you're going to do environmental impact assessments, then do realize that they often require very large multidisciplinary teams. So it's not enough just to have environmental chemists. You also need the ecologists, the geologists, the PR people, people who know the regulations, a whole suite of people need to be involved. And finally, it's important to remember that environmental impact assessments, they're not just a tree hugging exercise. They're not just anti-development to try and stop things from happening. They're a way to make sure that when developments do go forward, they go forward in a way that has a long-term benefit and minimal impacts on the environment. That's all I wanted to say on environmental impact assessment. So if you have any kind of questions, I would be delighted to take them and discuss it with you. 
Okay, well, thank you very much, Ian. That uh, was a very interesting lecture and uh, certainly a good uh, mesh with some of the previous lectures we've had on risk assessment. And I think people will be able to see how the risk assessment process can fit into the uh, EIA uh, process. I seem to have lost sound there. I'm sorry. Uh, somehow I got cut off there. Oh, okay. um, We're back. So, uh, yes. Um, the question is how the afterward pollution effects of any development are assessed. So this would be uh, things like uh, decommissioning or maybe once things are operational. Uh, yes. Quite often as part of the the recommendations that are put forward at the end of the environmental impact assessment, in, involves a, a future monitoring plan so that the ongoing impacts can be uh, monitored and, and quantified uh, and that includes if it's going to be decommissioned future monitoring to make sure that species come back that plant communities get re-established migratory birds come back that kind of thing uh, so yes it's, uh, it's an important aspect uh, it's not just job done once the development is made you, know, you, you need that uh, forward uh, monitoring Uh, do we have uh, other questions for uh, Dr. Oliver? Uh, maybe while you're thinking about that, I'll ask one. Um, there, there are two groups that, um, at least in North America, seem to be having more and more impact on the environmental uh, impact assessment process. Uh, those are indigenous populations and the courts. And so I'm wondering uh, if what the situation is in Europe or in other jurisdictions. Uh, but also in terms of the sort of flowchart that you showed, uh, where in that flowchart you think um, we can uh, sort of alter the process so that you don't get to the end and yes. then end up with uh, court cases over whether the process was followed properly or not. Uh, yes, where I'm from originally in Australia, uh, they have a, a similar kind of issue with uh, making sure that Indigenous um, rights are respected and that it's not just tacked on at the end. So it's during, either during the screening step or during the, the scoping stage, um, that part of the impacts that need to be assessed are, are, are cultural uh, and also um, land rights uh, issues. In Europe, it, it's not a problem that I've had to deal with. Um, so I didn't have it specifically in, in my slides, but yes, uh, other jurisdictions, other areas like Canada and Australia, and they would certainly have in that second scoping stage um, some kind of assessment of the scale of the impact or how it influences with uh, Indigenous communities and then try and bring in some way to um, quantify that and then mitigate it. And I suppose the compensation aspect in the mitigation phase would um, then, in that situation, relate to how can the, the needs, um, and rights and, and desires of indigenous communities can be um, helped or aided by the development um, or, or whether it's just something that's going to be too much of uh, an, an impact and it just shouldn't go ahead. Um, so in, in those early stages is where it, it, should, it should happen. Okay, thank you. And uh, other questions for Ian? I know that we have many of our participants who are from uh, countries where English isn't your uh, first language, but please don't feel uh, inhibited of asking questions, or as I say, you can certainly type them in the uh, chat uh, function. Well, if we have no further questions, uh, I want to thank you again, Ian, for your, <coughs> excuse me, for your lecture, and uh, I hope you will all join us uh, for the uh, lecture next week. Thanks it was, again. It was a pleasure. Thank Bye you. Bye for now. Bye.